welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm Morgan Hafner with Becker's Health Overview. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into your panel control in the space labeled, enter a question for staff and clicking send. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. Additionally, throughout today's webinar, we will have a few poll questions for the audience. The poll questions will pop up directly on your screen. You can then select your answer from the options and click Submit. Thank you in advance for your participation. In about a week following the webinar, we will be sending all registrants a copy of the presentation to the email you used to register. Please be patient as the post-webinar preparation of materials can take some time. It is now my pleasure to start today's webinar by introducing our speaker. Marilyn Denegre Rumbin served as Director of Payer and Reimbursement Strategy at Cardinal Health. Marilyn is a subject matter expert on health policy, payer and reimbursement strategy for Cardinal Health. She is responsible for education, resources, analytics for health policy strategy, health economics, reimbursement, market access, and payer strategy. Marilyn is a sought after industry speaker on evolving trends and an educator on healthcare and payer contracting and strategy. With more than 25 years of experience in the healthcare arena, Marilyn has worked in hospital administration, practice management, healthcare contracting, and network development. She has spearheaded reimbursement and payer strategy initiatives and consulted in such areas as pharmacy, medical devices, durable medical equipment, and emerging technologies. Marilyn focuses on reimbursement and product commercialization services that strategize on opportunities to leverage the life cycle of medical technologies. She is successful in obtaining medical policy, payer initiatives, and beta projects for economic analysis for product adoption. At this time, I'm pleased to turn the floor over to Marilyn to begin today's presentation. Welcome. My name is Marilyn Denegri Rumbin. And as mentioned, I'm the Director of Payer and Reimbursement Strategy for Cardinal Health. As we begin this webinar, I ask you two questions. What are the major payer and reimbursement trends for 2018? And how will they impact your ambulatory surgery center? What opportunities can you take advantage of today while reimbursement policies continue to be finalized? If you can't answer these questions, you're in luck. These are the major topics that we will be covering today, and I will, be dis I will be discussing four major trends with you. First, the impact of hospitals and hospital outpatient centers on the ASC's case volume. Second, the ASC reimbursement trends. Third, I'd like to talk about changing demands with the ASC. And fourth, how private payers are seeking alternative payment models that reward the ASC for handling cases traditionally performed in hospitals. After this webinar, it is my hope that you'll be able to discuss the impact of the ASC healthcare and reimbursement trends in 2018. You'll be able to explain the outpatient prospective payment system and the final rule for 2018, outline some of the CMS initiatives for quality, referred to as meaningful measures, and I'd like to reveal the growing impact of patients as consumers. Also, outline the changes in alternative payment models. I'd also like to review how private payers are seeking alternative payment models as a solution for the ASC. Now let's get started Why Cardinal Health is uniquely qualified to help you succeed in this challenging environment. With more than 40 years of experience, Cardinal Health is a recognized leader with a top ranking for transforming the healthcare supply chain to meet new challenges around cost, revenues, and outcomes. As a supplier and leading manufacturer of medical surgical products, we have an unparalleled understanding of the healthcare value chain. So we're uniquely able to give you more of what you want most, a simple way to support your reputation of delivering quality care while lowering costs, all while the healthcare industry is undergoing significant transformation. Now, let's turn our attention to the leg legislative changes that will impact the ASCs in 2018. Before we jump into discussing the trends, I'd let me lay some of the groundwork regarding legislative changes that are impacting the ASC today. 
we have entered the next wave of health reform. There will be no direct repeal and replace, plus the new tax plan signed into law has implications of to mandates and health care. The impact will be far-reaching and may include continuation of the Medicaid expansion, drug pricing policies regarding the opiate crisis, acknowledging the opportunity. Health insurers are uniquely positioned to help improve prescription drug safety. We're also going to see um, a wave in redistribution and refunding of Medicare and Medicaid and the easing of macro requirements in 2018 and thereafter. The impact of the new tax plan after nearly a decade since the Affordable Care Act was signed into law, the U.S. is poised to find out what Obamacare would look like without its linchpin requirement for people to buy health insurance. Varying opinions and the CBO claim that the average health insurance premiums in the individual markets would increase by about 10%. But insurance markets would remain stable in almost all parts of the country, the budget office had found. The final bill also repeals the penalty that is imposed upon, under current law on individuals that fail to obtain minimum health care coverage, also known as the individual mandate. Now, this provision is effective with respect to health coverage status for months beginning after December 31st, 2018. Now, as mentioned, we're going to speak about the, I'm going to speak about the outpatient prospective payment system, which is the final rule for 2018, which we will dive into later in the webinar. Also, the new payment and risk sharing models mandated alternative payment models reversed. Beyond these legislative changes, we're here to discuss four major trends that will impact your ASC in 2018. Now, let's get right to them. The evolving relationship with hospitals and the hospital outpatient centers as acquisition activity and competition continue to increase. We'll also see a declining trend in ASC reimbursements. There is, this is where we will get into the outpatient prospective payment system's final rule, MACRA, MIPS, the quality measures referred to as meaningful measures. And the morale of the story is that you'll have to look more closely at volume to increase revenue. Now, changing demands were the ASCs, which will include key drivers like healthcare consumerism and technology. And private payers seeking alternative payment models. Private payers and employers are leading the way with innovative new approaches to improving cost, quality, which means new opportunities for the ASC. Before I go further, let's show our, our audience the first poll question. Which of the four trends for 2018 do you expect to have the biggest impact on your ASC? Your answer choices are evolving relationship with hospitals and hospital outpatient centers, ASC reimbursement trends, the changing demands for the ASC, and private payers seeking alternative payment models. Now, I'll give you a few seconds to respond, and then we'll take a look at those responses. Thank you for participating in this poll. You can see the varying levels of responses on the screen now, and you're in luck, because I'll be discussing each trend in detail as we move forward in the presentation. Let's jump into our first trend. It's no surprise that there's a, there is an evolving relationship with hospitals, hospital outpatient centers, ASCs, and this trend isn't going away anytime soon. We continue to see more hospital acquisitions of ASCs and outpatient centers, and more hospital competition against the ASC. So ASCs are facing competition from hospitals and other outpatient facilities that have more favorable reimbursement. There is also an obvious shift in surgery volume from hospitals and hospital outpatient departments to the ASC. The rise in minimal invasive surgery is driving many procedures once performed in hospitals to the ASC. The rationale behind this is that minimal invasive surgeries are associated with low risk for complications, reduced hospital stays, and lower costs and reductions in hospital readmissions. Now, cardiac surgery is a large segment which is growing 
has a growing number of procedures becoming um, minimal evasive. Surgeons, surgeons also can perform minimal evasive procedures such as arthroscopy, robotic assisted hysterectomies, aortic valve surgeries, endoscopic robotic cardiac surgery in the outpatient setting. We also see an expansion in spine and hip procedures in the ASC. So, how can we take advantage of this evolving relationship? Outpatient surgery will play an integral role in the value-based healthcare system. The healthcare industry evolution away from fee-for-service care continues to gain traction and is changing the game for the ASC as the quest for value replaces volume. And as hospital systems try to optimize ambulatory care platforms by embracing strategic, structural, and operational approaches to enhance the value-based care strategies. Now, ASCs provide equal or better outcomes at a lower cost. There's a study by U.S. Berkeley that demonstrates ASCs equally drive $2.5 billion in Medicare savings. Now, hospitals now support moving cases to the ASC as they take on risk with new payer contracts. And certificate of need states, regulations to convert existing hospital outpatient departments may be easier than building new facilities. Unheard of five years ago, physician preference and patient convenience, lower costs and better outcomes are driving conversion of hospital outpatient departments to the ASCs, often as a joint venture between hospital systems and respective physician groups. This trend will continue in the marketplace. I recommend taking advantage of the trend in three ways. As a growth strategy, ASCs can drive volume by partnering with independent or splinter surgeons. Two, as a retention strategy, retain partnerships with key surgeons looking to partner with competitive health system or develop their own. Third, as ASCs challenge, equal pay for some procedures for the same procedures that hospitals perform. As you know, there is a 50% discrepancy in reimbursement rates between the ASC and hospitals, hence the focus on volume. And the differential for hospital outpatient is 40%. As you can see here, surgery volume is indeed shifting to the outpatient setting in alignment with the macro trend in value-based care. In the chart at the left, Notice the tremendous growth in outpatient versus the rapid decline in inpatient surgeries. At right, you can see the projected major growth in these key specialties. There are additional trends driving surgery volume to the ASC, such as total joint replacement. The shift from hospital to ASC continues to gain momentum. Bundle payments, fastest growing payment type expected to reach 17% of all medical payment types in the next five years. Employed in physicians as ASC partners, as health systems build strategic ambulatory platforms that include the ASC joint ventures as an important recruitment and retention tool. The once ill-advised practice of offering employed physicians physician ownership in the ASC has become a trend. In addition, specialty centers, more robust ambulatory platforms feature an increasing variety of interconnected assets to help raise the utility and profitability of each resource beyond its own specific contribution to revenue. Next, I have another audience polling question for you. In which geographic setting is your AC located? Within city limits, suburbs, or rural areas? Please tell us what your choices are. I will again give you a few seconds to respond and then we'll take a look at those responses. Ah, that's an interesting response from our audience. As trending reports have revealed that the distribu distribution of rural ASCs mirrors that of urban ASCs. That is, that rural ASCs are more likely to be located in higher population areas in states without certificate of need regulations and in states located in the south. The growth rates and distribution of urban and rural ASCs suggest that urban markets may be becoming saturated with the rural markets are growing. 
It is possible that this trend reflects not only an urban saturation phenomena, but it is also showing an increase in the attractiveness of setting up an ASC practice or expanding marketing efforts in rural communities. An increase in the ASC market presence could also make physician joint ventures a more viable option for the hospitals. Next, we'll turn our attention to the second major trend, ASC reimbursement changes, where I'll mention how geography can be your opportunity. So now, let's focus on ASC reimbursement trends. Outpatient prospective payments final rule for 2018, the changes result in a 1.2 adjusted consumer price index. MACRA will be here to stay, and ASCs are relatively well positioned to take advantage of this. Now, there was discussion about MIPS being be, will be replaced with the Voluntary Value Program, the VVP. This will include across the board withhold for all fee schedule payments. Performance assessed via uniform measures across critical, I'm sorry, across clinical quality, patient experience, and value. The goal here is better prepare physicians to participate in the Medicare and CHIPS Reauthorization Act's other tracked advanced alternative payment models. Now, I had mentioned earlier that meaningful measures is a quality opportunity within CMS, and CMS will take 18 specific areas to refocus the agency's regime of quality metrics on high quality healthcare and meaningful outcomes for patients. Great opportunity. New uh, procedure opportunities are also going to be made available. We have a plethora of procedures with the following. Ophthalmology, orthopedics, ENT, GI, urology, OBGYN, pain management, cosmetic, trauma, vascular, general surgery, neurosurgery, to name a few, and spine. ASC market can be geographically driven, and orthopedics will grow due to the joint replacement changes um, from mandated to um, more uh, open procedures with the ASC. Also, the great opportunity that's somewhat overlooked is the interventional cardiology and interventional radiology procedures. Now, I'd like to focus on the outpatient prospective payment system's final rule for 2018. And I've given you an overview and I'm, uh, of the um, o OPPS and the hospital uh, ambulatory surgical, surgical center payment systems, including the quality reporting programs. The final rule includes updates to payment rates for Medicare services under the hospital outpatient perspective payment system and the ASC payment system and to refine re the requirements for the hospital quality um, and ASC quality reported programs for 2018. For the ASC, the final rule changes as a result in 1.2 adjusted consumer price index. CMS estimates the total payments to the ASC pro providers, including beneficiary cost sharing an estimated change in enrollment, utilization, and case mix for 2018. This would be approximately $4.6 billion, an increase of approximately $130 million compared to an estimated 2017 ambulatory surge payment system. The projections are very promising. Next, let's discuss MACRA and it is here to stay and the changes to MIPS. The payment landscape is shifting under the U.S. healthcare industry with a volume to value transformation, but in place by the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act of 2015, known as MACRA. The traditional fee for service payments are being replaced with financial incentive framework that rewards for improved quality, outcomes, and costs. Now, this shift to value-based reimbursement models creates a new paradigm in which care is delivered by an entire coordinated care community sharing in the responsibility and risk of outcomes and costs touching almost every part of the healthcare delivery operation. While the law directly impacts only Medicare payments today, it lays the groundwork and provides strong incentives for other payers to move in the same direction. 
thus potentially disrupting the healthcare system at all levels. Ultimately, value-based payments transform traditional business models by putting significant revenue and risk at stake. Building the outcome-based financial models and data infrastructure to maximize value-based care reimbursement pathways will be fundamental to sustainable growth in the future. The healthcare players left standing strong will likely be the ones that strategically embrace change, starting now to understand the impact of macro and the new value-based payment models to their organizations. These healthcare players will customize the broad array of value-focused shared savings, shared risk, and bundled payment models that will work for their individual situations and the populations. Now, the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid released the 2018 Quality Payment Program, or QPP, proposed rule. This proposes policies for the merit-based incentive payment system, referred to as MIPS, an advanced alternative payment model programs for 2018 to impact 2020 Medicare physician payments. Specifically, CMS is proposing the following policies in an effort to offer flexibility and reduce burden with the following. They'd like to be offering the virtual group's participation option, increasing the low volume threshold to $90,000 in allowed Medicare Part B charges or 200 patients. Also, it would allow the continued use of 2014 edition of the CEHRT. Now, adding bonus points to the scoring methodology for caring for complex patients and using the 2015 edition of the CEHRT exclusively. Now, including MIPS performance improvement in the quality performance scoring. In addition, including the option to use facility-based scoring for facility-based clinicians. Flexibility for clinicians in small practices, including a a new hardship exemption under the ACI performance category. Now, bonus points added to the final score and bonus points for measures in the quality performance category that don't meet data completeness requirements. I know that's a mouthful and this will be made available to you in more detail if you need it. Now, I'd also like to mention about the merit-based incentive payment system for 2018. CMS proposed to weight each of these categories at the same weight at 2017. There's the quality category, which will be at 60%, the cost category at zero, advanced care information category is at 25%, and improvement activities at 15%. CMS is also proposing to implement policies enacted under the 21st Century Cures Act, which would exempt providers practicing solely in AFCs from the ACI category, that's the Advanced Care Information category, and to provide a hardship exemption for small practices. In both cases, the provider's category score would be reweighted to the quality category. Now, AFCs are in transition to meet the challenges of the new healthcare world. The transition from the fee for service to value-based is one of the greatest financial challenges currently faced by the ASC. Providers are not only shifting to shared value, they are shifting to shared risk. Private payers are also seeking private payment models that will contain costs, create market share, and have risk sharing elements. Now, Medicare and private payers have timely access to claim data and analytics. And private payers and employers are open to partnerships with the ASCs. Providers that can't achieve their required scores will face financial penalties and lower reimbursements. This is why providers are focused on broad-ranging clinical and financial, as well as operational improvements. In particular, there's a heightened focus on succeeding with alternative payment models, such as value-based purchasing and resharing payment models. At the same time, the ASC are striving to stay ahead ahead of healthcare reform. There's the ever-present need to support safety and the quality of patient care. Now let's wrap up our reimbursement trends overview by discussing how CMS has created new procedure opportunities for the ASC by reversing mandatory bundles for hip and knee, cardiology, and 
and oncology for 2018. Many ASCs are already performing these procedures on non-Medicare patients. The Ambulatory Sur uh, Surgery Center Association estimates more than 200 ASCs across the country are currently performing joint replacement procedures. The popularity of high acuity outpatient procedures, as well as the increase in bundle payment models will result in the downward pressure on implant prices. The rationale is that if a surgeon is an ASC owner, they may have incentive to use a cost-effective implant solution. Surgeons haven't historically monitored implant pricing, but that is changing with the risk assessment, acceptance excuse me, of bundle payments and the ASC ownership. Now, CMS has also approved nine ASC spine codes, including laminectomies, and while these have been performed in the ASC for up to a decade beforehand, there has been some hesitancy due to the safety concerns and lack of payer contracts. However, evidence now exists to prove spine surgeries can be performed safely in the outpatient setting, and payers are more willing to reimburse for spine in the ASC. Next, I'd like to turn our attention to the third major trend, the changing demands ASCs will see in 2018. Our healthcare environment demands we become more flexible and creative. I would like to point out areas to keep on the ASC radar. Technology key to measuring and improving quality, IT integration and interoperability, the EMR introduction and integration, healthcare assessment related to the IT and the patient EMR. Next, real world examples from Cardinal Health. NaviHealth assisting ASCs with alternative payment models and post-acute care. As spend essentials, this reduces costs to help offset tighter reimbursements. For example, analyzing costs per case by physicians to identify opportunities for improvement. Now, focus on care management, continued investment, focus on reducing loss of stay and readmission rates are going to be very critical. New and pre pre- and post-surgical programs show to improve outcomes and they reduce the inpatient utilization. Now, market forces are transforming patients into consumers in the expanding network of consumer options and high outpatient growth driven by consumerism and technology. Let's move by taking a closer look at what healthcare consumer is and what its impact is on the ASC. Healthcare consumerism is defined as transforming a small benefit plan into one that puts economic purchasing power and decision making in the hands of participants. It's about supplying the information, decisions, and support tools they need, along with financial incentives, reward, and other benefits that encourage personal involvement in altering health and healthcare purchasing behaviors. To meet the overall imperative to deliver high quality, low cost care, providers are stepping up their focus on the patients they serve. Medicare has created incentives to promote this behavior. Basing a hefty share of its hospital value based purchasing rewards and penalties on patient responses to a post discharge survey. The quality measures are opportunities for increasing that reimbursement, improving outcomes, and of course, patient satisfaction. Indeed, market forces are transforming patients into consumers. So what steps are the ASCs taking to win their business? We have to ensure accountability for the patient experience. You have to encourage regular rounding by administrators. Patient experience teams can help differentiate, underscore the importance of a patient experience track experience-related performance to tailor improvement efforts, recruit past patients as a patient ambassador to validate, offer staff insider understanding of the patient experience. In addition, orient services around patient preference. Consider telemedicine or telehealth to reduce the patient burden for procedures with significant preoperative requirements, such as bariatrics. Evaluate open access endoscopy as a tactic to incorporate PCPs as specialty care partners. Execute on patient's desire for enhanced access. Now target marketing and service offerings to specific populations. 
assess local population demographics and marketing channel preferencing. I also align services with the local demand based on disease prevalence and then cultural factors. As the network of consumer option expands, providers are competing to draw patients upstream. So what steps can the AC and ASC take? My recommendations is deliver on the PCP service expectations. Consider the proximity to referring physicians when developing specialized ambulatory sites, such as a GI endoscopy center. Embed specialists in PCP clinics when appropriate to maximize patient access. That multi-specialty approach is a, a great way to leverage this. The other is engage PCPs in the post-operative care pathway to build long-term relationships. As I mentioned, telehealth and telemedicine is an area to leverage the, here as well. Evaluate the opportunity for new services and subspecialties. Assess outstanding market demand for surgical procedures, specialties, and technologies. Determine the organization's capabilities, long-term strategic goals, and appetite for investment also secure physician buy-in for developing any new offerings. I'd also like to mention develop clinical partnerships to fill the gaps in service. Evaluate local, regional, national opportunities to develop joint ventures, co-branded specialty services, and enhance referral relationships. Consider how best to incorporate independent physician practice leaders into a hospital-based service line leadership. I have a third and final audience polling question. And the question is, aside for the cost of surgery, what do you think is the second most important factor that surgery shoppers consider when choosing a provider? Your answer choices are A, quality of surgeon, B, healthcare cost, C, hospital affiliation, D, travel time to the hospital, location of a follow-up visit. Now, I'll give you a few seconds to respond, and then we'll take a look at the responses. Oh, that's very interesting. As we move to the next slide, I'll dive into these factors in more detail. As healthcare consumers, patients are becoming astute shoppers of surgery services. Here the fa are the major factors that consider when choosing a provider. For surgery shoppers, cost is overwhelming, the most important consideration. Second is travel time to the hospital. And as you can see here, hospital affiliation and the recommendations of referrers all also matter. It is likely not a surprise to anyone, but to reiterate, surgery shoppers focus first on cost. In summary, healthcare consumerism and technology are both key drivers in the growth of outpatient volume. Growth in the ASC volume is projected to far outpace both the hospital outpatient departments and endoscopy centers. For example, while the hospital outpatient um, department's volume is expected to grow by 11% over this period, ASC volume is estimated to increase at nearly three times that rate so in the chart on the left, you can see where the growth is anticipated to occur by subservice lines. Now, to address these trends, private payers are seeking alternative payment models and risk-sharing arrangements, and that creates an immediate opportunity for the AFC and an opportunity to discuss the fourth major trend impacting the AFC. Private payers and employers are leading the way to innovation. There are preference pricing, direct employer contracting, private bundles, and procedure warranties. Now, private payers are also rewarding the ASC for handling hospital cases. The goal is, is to improve value and quality reduce, while having better control of cost of care. The ASC private payer collaboration improves also network access. There's also an employer component in this that we can expand at a later time. 
ASC opportunities also use payer data to target those employers, get exclusive carve-outs and agreements, drive volume and revenue, and demonstrate that quality outcomes to increase revenue. To wrap up today's discussion, here are key takeaways that you can begin to apply to your own ASC. The outpatient prospective payment systems final rules and MACRA are an opportunity. Consumerism and the private payer collaboration are a bigger one. Use data analytics to target employers and patients. Under the age of 65, procedures with less risk. If procedures are complex, they may be a challenge for the ASC due to recover time. So to identify the best candidates for complex surgeries are vital. Now utilize technology to coordinate care and differentiate your ASC. Private payer, patient, PCP, and ASC are all on the same page. The well cared for patient will be key for the PCP buy-in. Next, I'd like to mention facilitate the cost-effective growth. Rise size specialized service distribution. Find your niche, do it well, and then manage your surgical costs. Contribute to population health management goals, and you'll have a win-win situation. Remember, keep a pulse on quality, value, and the cost for a recipe of, for success. Helping the ASC make the most of the major trends we've been discussing today is a center of excellence for Cardinal Health. Every day, we're helping ASCs across the country collaborate more closely closely with private payers and employers to create these new opportunities despite a changing regulatory environment. We're also helping ASCs better understand and make the most of accelerating the trend in healthcare consumerism. Through it all, we help ASCs leverage the power of data analytics to identify and close gaps in efficiency, freeing up more resources to take advantage of these major trends. Now, by keeping one eye on regulatory change and the other on opportunities, the ASC can take advantage of today. We're helping you to be more proactive in an uncertain environment. If you'd like to learn more about how Cardinal Health can help you navigate and take advantage of these major trends, please contact me following this presentation. Thank you very much for your time and attention today. And now I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Marilyn, for that fantastic presentation. We will now begin oh, today's my question pleasure. and answer session. Thank you. We will now begin today's question and answer session. Please submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. We will try to get through as many questions as we have time for. And we're getting a ton of great feedback from the audience. Marilyn, one audience member wants to know more about slide 15. On slide 15, you mentioned that technology is key to measuring and improving quality. With outside forces like Google and Amazon coming in, what are some things I can do to prepare for the impact of newer, more advanced, and possibly disruptive technologies? Oh, that's a great question. Research has shown that when patients are engaged in their care, it can lead to measurable improvements in safety and quality. This can be enhanced by healthcare analytic tools, which re view trends and data for the patient. Healthcare professionals play a vital role in improving health outcomes, quality of care, and overall care experience of patients. Health information technology or health IT is an important tool that can use to improve clinical practices and the health and experience of your patients. Now, health IT can improve and support healthcare professionals to do what they do best, which is provide excellent care to patients, and healthcare technologies encompass a wide range of electronic tools that can help you and the patient. Um, some can be access to date evidence-based clinical guidelines and decision support, uh, support improved quality of care and safety, provide proactive health maintenance, uh, better coordinated patient's care with other providers through the secure and private sharing of clinical information. 
I'd also like to mention quality improvement and clinical decision support rely on information about your patient population being readily available in the digital form. So health IT can help you monitor your patient's health status and make specific and targeted recommendations to improve your patient's health. Now access to real-time data through electronic health records and health IT will help you. So I have some recommendations. You use clinical decision support to highlight care options tailored to your patients. You can improve safety by highlighting drug interactions or allergies when ordering medications. Connect with patients with community and educational resources to better manage their health. And then health IT improves care delivery organization efficiency with administrative processes. And health IT can improve the administrative processes and workflows of your practice. Um, the advantages to using health IT in your practice include applications and tools support, clinical processes like text messaging, appointment reminders to your patients, uh, faster data processing for you and your staff, including sending and receiving your patients' lab results faster, and then timely and improved access to information needed before, after, and the point of care, including access to your patients' electronic health records and diagnostic test results remotely. But with more medical professions using personal mobile devices to communicate and collaborate on patient outcomes, I it is really critical that healthcare organizations address the use of technology and apply HIPAA compliance. Many forms of frequently used communication are not HIPAA compliant, and unsecured channels of communication generally include text messaging, Skype, and email because, uh, because copies of messages are left on service providers, uh, servers um, other than the health organization, which has no control. So the security rule um, lists a series of specifications for the technology to comply with HIPAA that I'd like to mention. It's a, um, a little oversight. And that would be that all protected healthcare information, PHI, must be encrypted at rest and in transit. Uh, in addition, each medical professional authorized to access, communicate with a PHI must have a unique, uh, unique user identifier so that their use of PHI can be monitored. And then finally, um, the use of any technology to comply with HIPAA must have an automatic log off to prevent unauthorized access to the PHI when a mobile device is left unattended. Um, this also applies to desktop computers. Um, so I want to just stress that the HIPAA compliance is critical so that protocols and security are compliant with IT usage. Uh, each provider must avoid breaches to ensure protection on healthcare information and patient privacy. Um, the penalties are stiff and privacy information is priceless. That was a fantastic breakdown, Marilyn. Thank you so much for all the great examples. We have an audience member that is wondering about a trend in the ASC market. Are facilities seeing contraction or growth? Uh, over the years, the number of ASCs has grown in response to demand from the key participants in surgical care, so patients, physicians, and insurers. While this demand has been made possible by technology, it has also been driven by patient satisfaction, efficient physician practice, high levels of quality, and cost savings that, all been, that have benefited all. Now, however, the growth of the ASC has slowed in recent years. If the supply of the ASC does not keep pace with the demand for outpatient surgery that patients require, that care will be provided in the less convenient and more costly hospital outpatient departments. Technological advancement has allowed a growing range of procedures to be performed safely on an outpatient basis. Unfortunately, um, Medicare has been slow to recognize these advances and assure that its beneficiaries have access to them. So faster acting and more effective anesthetics and less invasive techniques such as arthroscopy have driven the outpatient migration. Now procedures that only have a few years ago required major incisions, long acting anesthetics and um, extended convalescence can now be performed through closely techni uh, closed techniques utilizing short acting anesthetics, uh, minimal invasive recovery uh, time, and uh, as medical innovation continues to advance, more and more procedures will be able to be performed safely in the ambulatory, ambulatory setting. 
And as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, as the growth areas, I want to cons people to con consider to keep on their radar interventional radiology and interventional cardiology procedures because these will migrate due to the future technological advantages and the changes in reimbursement. Thank you for clarifying that, Marilyn. And we're getting a lot of engagement from the audience today. Another member is wondering, throughout the webinar, you explained the role that private payers will play in 2018 as they seek alternative payment models. Taking into account all the different payer types, private, commercial, government, and independent, what do you expect the overall mix to look like in the year ahead? When reviewing the data on payer mixes and the trends in the ASC, commercial insurance um, makes up more than half of the ASC payer mix. Um, I had that on another presentation where we actually dived into this. Um, there are opportunities and challenges which need to be kept in mind. Uh, commercial payers do have reimbursement methodologies that multiple procedures are performed, there is a reduction taken. Now, review your contract and special arrangements for things like changing rates, carve-outs, implants, and biologics. Um, another note, uh, there are also risk-sharing arrangements, possibly exclusivity for special ASCs considered a center of excellence or an important specialty. Uh, be sure to demonstrate quality, uh, value, and managing the cost of care. Now, the commercial payers have different incentives for bundling payments than the government payers, uh, like Medicare and Medicaid. So commercial payers are driving business to facilities with contracts that can be beneficial for the AFC because the contracts, contract rates are lower than the hospital. So Medicare does retrospective bundles. Um, and Medicare sets a rate, and if the episode of care costs more than the set rate, providers owe Medicare the difference. If the care costs less than the bundled rate, providers distribute the remaining amount among key stakeholders. I'd also like to mention there's a new trend as well with the uh, private payers looking at implant costs and actually partnering with ASCs to um, uh, actually become the buyer with the or purchaser for the implants and sharing that invoice cost with the ASC. So keep that on your radar because that is going to be a changing trend we will see. Excellent. Thank you, Marilyn, for breaking that down for us again. And looks like we have time for one question today. Um, one more question from the audience. A member is wondering, is there a new trend for managing the cost of implants through new contract arrangements with payers? Ah, well, I guess this is a follow-up from our, our um Last question. In the last several years, um, a contentious issue in managed care contouring has been implants and carve-outs for costly procedures. Um, these are two different topics, both relative to payer negotiations. Um, carve-outs are defined as procedures categorized in one payment level by Medicare and or a payer level of reimbursement, but due to cost concerns, a provider wishes to carve out that procedure and increase its reimbursement. This is commonly done in the ASC specialized with well-known physicians in a market where the inflated procedure cost at local hospitals greatly increase the spend by payers or employers. So many payers will negotiate these carve-outs on a limited basis. Now, implant reimbursement has become, excuse me, become sensitive in contract negotiations because implant, implants are an unpredictable cost to the payer. Frequently used in orthopedics, neurosurgery, hand surgery, implants costs will continue to increase until some implants come off with trademark. Generic or off-trademark companies have made inroads competing with well-known manufacturers, reducing the cost of certain implants. But implants will continue to be expensive, and managing their costs is a major current concern for the ASC administrators and managers. Now, on the reimbursement side, payers are using third parties with consolidated purchasing power so they can make a profit by buying implants in bulk and receive reimbursement by insurance companies. Many national payers are now contracting with these firms as it makes the implant cost more predictable for their budgets. From a payer contracting perspective, 
it is now common for payers to negotiate a minimum threshold based on the implant cost for an ASC. And this threshold can range from $250 to $5,000. Once the cost threshold is achieved, the payer will reimburse the cost of the implant based on that invoice, and the provider absorbs some of that implant cost. I hope that Marilyn able to answer the question. <laughs> yes, that was great and very helpful for us. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing your expertise with us today. And this includes today's program. I want to thank Marilyn for her excellent presentation and to our audience for participating. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars.